This is the fourth day of the building of a 1,000-bed hospital in Wuhan. This is the epicenter of this novel coronavirus. 1,000 people have died in the past 24 hours. Killed more people in China alone than SARS did worldwide. It is being contained. Characterized as a pandemic. Chinese virus. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? Italy now topping more than 10,000 deaths. Spain continues to see a dramatic rise in the number of deaths. Dozens of laboratories are now battlegrounds in the race for a vaccine. You already know the story of how coronavirus took over the world. And as we were all forced to slow down to flatten the curve, news broke of how air quality suddenly improved and of how nature was coming back. But none of this has had a significant impact on CO2 levels on a global and long-term scale, nor will it be enough to permanently mitigate global warming. It's difficult to make a one-on-one -on -one comparison of two different crises. But the reactions of governments to tackle a global emergency like the coronavirus pandemic versus decades of global inaction to solve an equally life-threatening climate crisis is very telling of what is actually going on. Many governments who failed to take action on the climate crisis have responded fairly rationally to the coronavirus. A threat to our lives was met with countermeasures to contain the pandemic. The reason entire societies are now taking part in a total social shutdown is that we can all easily grasp the real immediate threat of the pandemic. The effects of the pandemic are tangible. We hear or see of someone being infected, getting sick, and in some cases, even losing their life. And yet climate change is already affecting our lives too. Perhaps, if more media covered the climate crisis like a dangerous disease, governments would take it just as seriously as this pandemic needed to be taken. But environmental problems are rarely covered by the media just as exhaustively, despite their very high death tolls. Let's look at air pollution, for example, caused by an excess of greenhouse gases emitted by cars and other human activity. The World Health Organization estimates that 4.6 million people die every year prematurely from respiratory difficulties directly linked to air pollution. Patients with respiratory difficulties are now at greater risk of COVID-19 complications and for those currently contracting the new disease, unclean air is very bad news too. Scientists at Stanford recently estimated that China's pandemic lockdown alone might have saved as many as 77,000 lives by curbing CO2 emissions from factories and vehicles. In other words, the coronavirus outbreak has proven once and for all, there is a link between our economy and the health of our planet. The trouble with climate change is that, so far, it's not being felt by most wealthy societies. To date, climate change is mostly taking its toll on people who live in the developing world or on the lowest income groups of rich economies. Now, with the looming economic crisis resulting from the measures taken to contain the coronavirus, there's a danger that existing social inequalities will deepen after the pandemic is over. But it doesn't have to be that way. The fact that many governments reacted so drastically to the coronavirus outbreak proves that strong economies do have the structural, financial and political ability to react quickly to a life-threatening crisis. And that our societies are capable and empathetic enough to make sacrifices for the common good. Now that we know what's possible, the corona pandemic actually gives us a unique and historical window of opportunity to make the structural changes needed to transition towards a fair and ecologically sustainable economic system. This is where you and I have to be vigilant. As governments try to keep our economies afloat, they might relax their environmental standards to maximize what little economic activity is still feasible. They will, in other words, attempt to go back to business as usual. In fact, this is exactly the trend we are seeing in places like China. As some cities slowly lift the lockdown, the Chinese government is ready to reboot its economy at any cost, particularly at the expense of the environment. Governments in the US and Europe will decide how to invest emergency funds that businesses are demanding, given that they were forced to pause their activities. Which industries are our governments planning to support? At the point of making this video, 
some highly fossil fuel hungry industries, such as oil and coal companies, aviation or car manufacturers, are on track to secure funding from their governments. Should these industries receive that money unconditionally? Unlike what happened during the 2008 financial crash, when governments gave billions to save banks, this time we should not bail out companies that caused the climate crisis in the first place. This is how the money governments and industries have should be spent. A carbon tax. Introduce a tax on CO2 emissions that reflects the environmental damage these emissions are causing. If companies with small environmental footprints got more bailout money than environmentally destructive ones, many businesses would be looking at ways to reduce their emissions. Couple those measures with long-term economic funds that accelerate the skill development of workers as they transition away from those polluting industries. From well-funded universal welfare systems to unconditional basic income models, there are many feasible and tested solutions that don't leave anyone behind. Commit to long-term investments into renewable energy. This is the time to start transforming our energy infrastructures for good. If any of this sounds familiar, that's because we have been in a similar situation before. When the collapse of Lehman Brothers on September 15, 2008 triggered the biggest economic crisis since World War II, there were no real alternatives to a neoliberal system that had gotten out of hand. Nobody had done the work of combining existing solutions into a holistic policy plan, ready to be implemented in a time of crisis. Today, proposals like the US Green New Deal or the European Green Deal Initiative are roadmaps towards a resilient economic system within our planetary boundaries. If we don't push for these changes now, governments will go down the same path as they did in 2008. The public bailout money the banking and financial sectors received during the crash did nothing to restructure an economic system that has proven unsustainable yet again, both for people and the climate. This time around, we should not perpetuate a system that will compromise anything for profit. One thing's for sure, after Corona, our societies will never be the same. This is what you and I can do to make them change for the better. Dare to dream big. Inform yourself about the Green New Deals of Europe and the US. The better you understand the solutions that are being proposed, the better you'll be able to advocate for them. When you go vote at local, regional or national level, vote responsibly. Ask yourself, how exactly are your candidates planning to transition to a fair, green and sustainable economy? How have they voted in the past on environmental legislation? There are many things you can do online to take action. Read the description below this video for inspiration. In times of crisis, things can seem bleak and impossible to change. But whenever you think back on the corona crisis, remember these images of how a big majority of us subjected ourselves to a lockdown for the common good. Of how we found ways to make our support and our hope for better times be heard.